For the most part, conspiracy theories are just that, theories. But here are a few conspiracies that just might be true. See what you think. We're starting with old Tricky Dick, because it was his Watergate scandal that seemed to open up the dam of American distrust towards their government. But this isn't about Watergate at all. In fact, some people would argue, Watergate was the more benign of his crimes. It was 1968. America was in the midst of a heated presidential election, on par with 2016, by the way. Nixon was running against Hubert Humphrey, the sitting vice president. Among the divisive issues of the time, the Vietnam War was front and center. Lyndon Johnson, the Democratic incumbent, knew he had to bring an end to the war for Humphrey to win. And Nixon, some argue, was determined that could not happen. The theory claims that while the Johnson administration was negotiating a ceasefire between the South and North Vietnamese, Nixon guys were secretly communicating with the South Vietnamese, asking them to stop the peace talks, promising better terms if he were elected. In the midst of Johnson's peace talks, the South Vietnamese for some reason kept their bombing campaign, even after LBJ had convinced them to sign a peace treaty. Nixon just barely won the 1968 election, and it's not really clear if this was a direct result of the war. But it has become increasingly clear over the years that Nixon was probably involved in sabotaging official negotiations, which under US law would constitute treason, an act punishable by death. Here's some evidence. Henry Kissinger, a member of the Johnson administration, was the one who allegedly alerted Nixon of Johnson's peace talks. Nixon would later bring on Kissinger to be his national security advisor. Also, FBI records show that Anna Chenault, a Republican operative working for Nixon, was the one who secretly talked with the South Vietnamese. We know this because as Johnson suspected that Nixon was meddling in his negotiations, he ordered FBI surveillance on him and some of his aides. Sure, not the most noble of acts, but his fears may have been proven true. After his presidency, LBJ supposedly wanted to go public with the evidence of Nixon's treason. However, he opted not to, as he thought it would be bad for the country if people knew their president was a traitor. Plus, he probably didn't want to publicly acknowledge that he had the FBI monitor his rivals. Anyways, these allegations are true, and again that does remain an if, then karma eventually caught up to Nixon. After the Watergate scandal, he was forced to resign from office on August 9, 1974, and his reputation never recovered. This one probably shows up on many of these lists, but there's a good reason for that. There is some pretty lucid evidence out there to suggest the moon landings were all part of one giant farce. Here's some background. NASA claimed six successful manned lunar landings between 1969 and 1972. In that time span, 12 astronauts supposedly walked on the moon. The first landing in 1969 was a huge deal, as the US and Soviet Union were in the midst of a Cold War and an intense space exploration race. So the moon landings were a matter of national pride, as well as potentially crucial exploration milestones. But not everyone was swept away by all of this. In 1976, a fellow named Bill Casing wrote a book called We Never Went to the Moon, America's $30 Billion Swindle. Casing was a former Navy officer and worked as a technical writer for a company that built rocket engines. In his book, he estimated that the chances of a successful moon landing were way less than 1%. He wasn't alone though. Many people accused NASA of colluding with Hollywood and Stanley Kubrick of staging the whole landing in a film studio. So this all sounds compelling, but really, what evidence actually exists? Well, to be honest, nothing all that tangible. But here's some science that people have referenced to support these conspiracies. British writer Marcus Allen stated that it would be too dangerous for people to go to the moon since radiation levels would be deadly. In particular, the astronauts would have to pass through what's called the Van Allen radiation belt, an experience that should have killed them instantly. Others claim that the moon's surface gravity would make it impossible for anyone to actually walk on the moon. Yeah, okay, but what about all those photos and videos that were taken? Well, some experts have noted some odd things with those two. For example, up on the moon, there should only be one source of light, the sun. However, some photos of the moon appear to show shadows running in different directions, suggesting multiple light sources. Some people submit the theory that artificial lights were used, meaning the photos must be fake, or at least taken in a studio. Then there's this mysterious rock that seems to have the letter C carved into it or that the photographs inexplicably lack stars. Other photos seem to be doctored. Like, check these out. Notice how the crosshairs appear to be behind certain objects. Sometimes crosshairs appear in photos, since they help the photographer with scaling, but they should be in front of the objects, not behind. And finally, there isn't really any air in the atmosphere. 
so why the crap would this American flag appear to be waving as though there were a nice breeze? And here's former President Bill Clinton giving his thoughts on the moon landing in his autobiography, My Life. Just a month before Apollo 11, astronauts Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong had left their colleague, Michael Collins, aboard spaceship Columbia and walked on the moon. The old carpenter asked me if I really believed it happened. I said, sure, I just saw it on television. He disagreed. He said that he didn't believe it for a minute and that them television fellers could make things look real that weren't. Back then, I thought he was a crank. During my eight years in Washington, I saw some things on TV that made me wonder if he wasn't ahead of his time. For their part, NASA has provided plausible explanations for all of these accusations, and public sentiment still seems to lean towards a legit moon landing. But hey, it's always going to be a great bar conversation. So this is a pretty controversial topic. On one hand, the addition of fluoride to public water supplies helps prevent tooth decay at very low cost to the American public. Tooth decay can actually be deadly if not treated correctly. Health experts and authorities agree that of the 25 countries around the world who use this practice, all of them are using levels that are considered safe. So what's so controversial here? Well, for one, too much fluoride causes fluoride poisoning with symptoms such as diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. Though rare, there were a few outbreaks of this in the 90s. But some have advanced a more sinister theory. They believe that the real goal behind water fluoridation is to control the world population and even people's minds as a means of world domination. Even Adolf Hitler has found himself mixed up in this. In a letter written in 1954 to the Lee Foundation of Nutritional Research, a chemist named Charles Perkins spells out what he believed was really happening. The real reason behind water fluoridation, he wrote, is not to benefit children's teeth. If this were the real reason, there are many ways in which it could be done that are much easier, cheaper, and far more effective. The real purpose behind water fluoridation is to reduce the resistance of the masses to domination and control the loss of liberty. Perkins later went on to assert that the idea was created by the Nazis and Russians and claimed that a German chemist who was working for the Nazis spilled the beans. He concluded his letter with the following. Any person who drinks artificially fluoridated water for a period of one year or more will never again be the same person mentally or physically. Citing different studies, people have suggested that fluoride lowers children's IQs or that it can mess with a woman's reproductive system. Conspiracy theorists have maintained it's all part of some kind of Illuminati plot to control the world. Well, you probably saw this one coming a mile away, but until they actually figure out who killed them and for what reason, we'll keep wondering what really happened. Okay, here's a brief, and we do mean brief background. John F. Kennedy, the 35th president of the United States, was hugely unpopular in the South thanks to his support of the civil rights of African Americans and for being Catholic. He also made some dangerous enemies among organized crime, since his brother and attorney general, Robert F. Kennedy, was cracking down on them. Plus, communists around the world, like the Soviets and Fidel Castro, had their beef with him too. So when he was shot to death on November 22, 1963, there were a number of potential culprits. As we know, Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested for the crime, but he was in turn shot by Jack Ruby two days later, so we may never get the full story there. Despite the official findings of the Warren Commission, most people don't think that Oswald acted alone. Because honestly, why would he? Also, former U.S. Marine sniper Craig Roberts thought that it's actually impossible to do it alone. He's credited with numerous kills while serving in Vietnam and was, of course, a professional sniper. He visited Daly Plaza and checked out the scene. The reason I knew that Oswald could not have done it was because I could not have done it. I walked away from the window in disgust. I had seen all I needed to know that Oswald could not have been the lone shooter, he said. There's also the physics involved of how long it takes to fire three shots and the accuracy it takes in the time it was known to take the shots, but that discussion is going to take way too long. So in the half century since, countless conspiracy theories have been advanced. Some say it was the CIA, others claim the Mafia did it. It could have been the KGB, or maybe Cuba was somehow mixed up in this. However, some go so far as to implicate the US government in the assassination, citing supposed evidence such as the intimidation and deaths of witnesses plus the tampering, fabricating, and suppression of evidence as proof. Some experts have theorized that the Warren Commission only used this faulty evidence as a way to confirm the crazed lone gunman theory. Since then, it has become widely accepted that there was another gunman, calling into question the original investigation. So did the government do this? Or at least cover it up? Who knows? Check out these next videos 